I'd like you to talk a little bit about the idea of 100 Year Starship, where, why you came up with it, and what its purpose is, what the goal is. 100 Year Starship was actually um, started as a result of one of the technical officers at DARPA saying, how do we get the explosive kind of innovation that happened during the Apollo program while we were trying racing to the moon? The idea was to come up with something that was so difficult that it would cause you to have to have radical leaps in technology design. So that's where 100 Year Starship came from, really this initiative to try to um, understand how to create those technologies, how to create that type of innovation. And I was fortunate enough to lead the team that won the RFP, the competitive RFP, mm -hmm. uh, to create an organization that could make this kind of uh, transformation happen. The name of our uh, proposal was An Inclusive Audacious Journey Transforms Life Here on Earth and Beyond. And you sort of notice the first word is inclusive. And that encompasses the vision, that whole inclusive, audacious, and transformation. Inclusive because I truly believe, in fact I know, that we would have people on the moon now, we would have a moon base, we would be on Mars, if the public at large had been included, if we had included the full range of talent and skills and um, ambitions worldwide. We lost, we lost um, our place in space from the perspective of everybody couldn't see themselves being involved. When I was a little girl growing up during the Apollo era, there's no way you could tell me that I would not, you know, be going to just work as a scientist on Mars. Or, you know, I mean, it's just because it would have uh -huh. been there. Yeah. Um, but because the public in some ways was left out, we didn't move further. And that's what we have to do if we want to do something as audacious and as bold as creating the kinds of capabilities needed for interstellar flight. Now those capabilities, whether they range from increased you know, ways of generating uh, energy much more efficiently and vast amounts of energy that you need in order to go faster or create energy that's needed when you're not within a solar system, right? Because you can't use solar power when you're in interstellar space. Right. Learning how to store and control, um, generate those types of energy. Just imagine if we go a little bit down that way then we start to transform energy usage here on Earth. If we start to understand the issues that are associated with um, a closed system, you know, with, with clothing, for example. Clothing is a very resource-intense industry, whether it's the, the growing of cotton, the manufacturing of clothing, the dyeing, the bleaching, the maintenance of clothing, the detergents, and all of those things, getting rid of clothing, right, yeah. disposing of it very resource intense. What about if we started to figure out and think about that here on Earth? Mm -hmm. It starts to change what we do, yeah. right? So we, you, can't, you can't really recycle cotton, but you can't recycle polyester. Mm -hmm. right. um, there comes the 70s polyester suits coming back, but <laughs> yeah, no. <right. laughs> the, Maybe but, not. <laughs> but so it's really about these, these radical leaps in knowledge. Um, we talk about human behavior. If we ever get to the point where we have the types of energy needed for interstellar flight, mm -hmm. getting to start to approach the speed of light, you know, relativistic speeds, then you start to be able to do really serious damage to this planet if you use that as a weapon. You can do really serious damage. So that means that in some ways we have to progress in terms of our behavior and our humanity in order to really move forward. Mm -hmm. We have to progress in terms of our humanity and our behavior. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that we need to do and understand. Yeah, well that, that brings me to my next question, which is that such a optimistic and long thinking view of well, where we need to go as human beings and civilization is directly coming into conflict with the current way we're organizing society, especially since the death of Kennedy and this has become very clear over the last two administrations um, with bailouts and wars and all kinds of, of things that people know about. So um, what are your thoughts about how we're going to uh, tackle that problem with something like, like this sort of mission? 
So here's what I personally, I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and what that basically means, I think, you know, in the short run, we'll do really foolish things, but, you know, we hope that the arc, you know, goes toward being better. Um, I hope we learn from our mistakes. How does 100 year starship sort of reach toward that helping, that transformation? Well, all the technologies, all the knowledge, all the infrastructure capabilities that we talk about can help to transform the world in a different way. If we can look at using remote sensing for land management, crop development, uh, health epidemiology, you know, in developing world, it changes things, right? And you can do it much more effectively in. Um, by looking down on a landscape and trying to do surveys from the ground. But we have to make sure that people understand that they can be a part of it. And then when they talk about space technologies, they're not only thinking about seeing the Buck Rogers spaceship go zoom, right, or the USS Enterprise, they're actually seeing that that weather satellite image that they have is a satellite in space, right? So right. that they're using that technology. Our global positioning satellite systems are um, the images that are used for magnetic resonance imaging using the algorithms that were done for a lot of planet imaging. And what's important about the idea of 100 year starship um, in terms of a capability creation is that very often it's easier for us to see ourselves and work on problems when they're, they're packaged, right? If yeah. you say, I want world peace. <laughs> Great, what's your pathway? You, know? <laughs> yeah. you can't do anything with that, uh -huh. right? right? But if you can start even, as difficult as it is, but if you said, I want to try to figure out, you know, all the things that are needed for Interstellar, at least you have a package that you maybe can work with. Um, and that package is really interesting because everything that we would need, all the capabilities that are needed to uh, actually make an interstellar journey with humans on board are the exact same things that we need to survive as a species on this planet. The interesting part about it is we're not all going to get off this planet. This is going to be our home for a long, 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 long time. Right? We may develop outposts, we may do everything, but the majority of us are going to be back here on this planet, so we need to figure out what to do. The 100 Year Starship, the idea of interstellar flight, uh, interstellar travel, deep space travel, is an incredible perspective, for a uh, lens through which to examine what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. so you're talking about a, a way of changing the way we relate to each other, dramatically. Can you expound upon what that might actually look like in the way we would change both interpersonal communication, but also relations among nations, but also uh, relations among this generation to generations which will be born after the current generations have all died away, people that we'll never actually meet? So, I don't know which, which part to start, but I'm going to start on the last one about generations. Um, Skip Gates, uh, Henry, Henry Gates from Harvard, um, he did, um, he did a whole, he's an anthropologist from Harvard, he did a whole thing, um, on, it's called African American Lives with PBS series, and he's done expanded to other places, but he was actually looking at the genealogy of African Americans, right? And so he chose six on his very first series, where he did um, genetic testing, so to sort of trace um, your your what he called the racial admixture, sort of like your racial composition, um, where you might have originated from in Africa, you know, or wherever your origins might have been, as well as sort of tracing out a genealogy and family tree here in the states. And something happened with me. It's unusual with African Americans that you could trace as far back as he did because of slavery and how slave owners kept records or didn't keep records. Right. And what he was able to do with me is to, I, I need to finish this, okay. Linda. And what he was able to do with me is to actually look back and understand what the, um, See, back in like to the 1800s, to like 1800, which was really, really unusual. And 
identify this this woman who was almost my age, right? And she asked me like, what would what would I think? What would I think she would think? And I was like, she probably had this huge grin on her face, right? Mm -hmm. That this might happen. He also was able to identify um, ancestors or relations of mine who had after the Civil War, there were these oral histories that were taken, and they they existed at the uh, Library of Congress, and he was able to find one from a Jemison, a black free slave, from the same plantation, who would have been a, a, a distant uh, relative of mine, who had this oral history. And what was my connection to them and that person sort of thinking about the future? That connection is, how do we think about ourselves? I can be connected to the back. I can see that, right? right. And I can see that connection to the future. We have to, we have to first of all, rec recognize that we're mortal and that we live through not just our genetic pool, but our contributions, right? Yeah. And that, that's the piece we have to see. It's very subtle. There's no way to make anybody do this. It's, again, you have to allow them to feel it and to see it. I think uh, Casey Hudson with um, Mass Effect had a really interesting statement when he said, people will start to play Mass Effects intending to be jerks, intending to be um, like as, as big a jerks as they could in the, in the development of the game. And what they saw instead was that when they saw the facial expressions, when they saw the actual interactions and the impact, they couldn't do that. So some kind of way we have to have people see that emotional connection and the actual impact of what they're going to be doing to the future. I don't have all the answers, but I think that if we, you said, what do we need to look like in the future in relationships with each other? We need to understand that there really are no lines on the boat, right? That um, the water from the U that's on the shores of the U.S. eventually circu circulates all the way around the world, right? Mm -hmm. That the wind circulates all the way around the world. That you know you can't pollute in your plant, and then assume that you're not going to breathe it too. Mm -hmm. Some kind of way we got to get that done, okay. or that the wonderful things that you do will also help you and will help generations to come. That's the reason why, again, we want to have so many people there. And let me just go back. That's not just the quote-unquote touchy-feely psychologist and psychiatrist and, you know, social folks. That's the, the, the physicists who come up with the ideas. It's the chemical engineers like me. It's the medical doctors. It's all of that contributes to it. And each one of us feels a passion for our fields. It's an emotional connection that we feel for our fields, even if we're a physicist, right? Even right. if we're a chemical engineer. It's that emotional connection that made us tough it out to be able to be there, just like it's the same emotional connection that makes a, um, a musician tough it out in all the practice and everything you have to do to be good and to be able to convey that information. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a gradual process, but you have to give it a time frame. The 100 year time frame is just far enough in the future that we don't just say, Aubrey, oh, you can't do it. But it's close enough that we know people who have lived for 100 years. Right. Yeah, you could actually have someone who was being born that would be alive to see it. Just, yeah. Well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you.